Next talk this afternoon is from Chris Bishop. And as you can see from his slide, uh, Chris is a, he's a, he's a fellow here. He doesn't work in the university day to day. He's a distinguished scientist and leads the machine learning and perception group at Microsoft Research here in Cambridge, uh, which, if you haven't been in Cambridge for a while, is on Station Road, just up by the, um, by the railway station. Chris is Vice President of the Royal Institution, Fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, and of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Earlier this year, the UK Science Council released a list of the 100 leading UK practicing scientists. And Chris is named as one of 10 people only in the investigator science category. In 2008, Chris gave the Royal Institution Christmas Lectures when his theme was high-tech prank. So, Chris, we uh, um, want to hear what you've got to say and show us today on machines that learn. Well, thank you for that introduction. And uh, so my field is called machine learning. And you may or may not have heard of machine learning, but it's almost certain that you've used machine learning recently, um, if not today, certainly within the last few days. Machine learning technology is used in thousands of different places. What's really interesting, especially for, for people in, like me in the field, is that this field is about to take off. In the next 10 years or so, we're going to see thousands and thousands of new applications of machine learning, and they're going to touch virtually every aspect of our lives. So I'm, in the next 20 minutes or so, just going to try and give you a little flavor for what the feel is about and, and why I think it's exciting. So I thought I'd begin with this. Now, it's um, apologies to Andy Fabian. It's not the largest object in the known universe, um, but it might possibly be the most complex object in the known universe. It's um, extremely sophisticated, and it performs miracles of information processing. And although we know a lot about the brain, we still really don't know how it solves those information processing problems. Well, we're very keen to be able to build machines that can do some of those um, information processing tasks automatically. So we want to get computers to be able to solve some of these tasks. And it's difficult. And one of the reasons why it's difficult is that these things work in very different ways. Now, the thing on the right, the microprocessor, we designed that so we know how that works. And essentially what it does is it follows a series of instructions, and they're called computer code or software. So software is just a series of very detailed instructions telling the machine what to do at each stage, and the microprocessor will perform thousands of millions of those instructions every second, and when you do enough little things in the right order, in the right way, it all adds up and you get a computer game or a word processor or a mobile phone or whatever it may be. So the thing on the right works by um, following instructions. The thing on the left doesn't. It isn't programmed in the same way. Instead, the thing on the left gets to be good at stuff by, by learning. A newborn baby has very limited capabilities, but they learn. They learn to recognize things because their parents say, this is a duck, this is a dog, and so on. And they learn. They learn from experience. So we're going to use that idea of learning, but we're going to apply that now to, to computers, and hopefully we'll be able to get computers to do all sorts of new things which they couldn't do previously. So this is an example of uh, the kind of task that the computer is very good at, multiplying big numbers together. Now, your, your laptop can do probably 1,000 million of these calculations a second, multiplying two 16-digit numbers together and getting the answer right to 16 digits uh, and getting it right every time. Now, if I tried this, it would, uh, it would take me most of the afternoon with a pencil and paper. I'm certain to make a mistake. Uh, and I think most people would find this sort of calculation very hard. So computers are good at this kind of thing because this problem can be expressed as a series of steps. And you're taught these in school. You know, you multiply the 5 by the 3, you get a 15, you write the 5 and carry the 1. It's a series, tiny little steps, each of which is very precise and very logical. And if you perform billions of those a second, then you can do multiplication. You're very good at um, uh, you know, working out the payroll at the end of the month and so on. Those sorts of things computers are very good at uh, and humans are rather bad at. Here's a problem that um, is the other way around. This is just, uh, what I did is just get a bunch of people to write out a particular word. And so each of these is written by a different person. And there's a lot of variability in this. Now, presumably, most of you can read what this word is uh, in, in all of these instances. It seems very easy. 
It turns out to be very difficult to get a computer to recognize human handwriting. And the reason has to do with that variability. If you start to dream up rules about a, a Y as a sort of this shape with a tail, you'll find somewhere else that it, oh, it has a loop in it. And every time you think of a rule, you'll find an exception somewhere. So it's not about rules, it's more about patterns. So we need a way of getting computers to solve this kind of problem, the kind of thing that people are very good at and that computers are currently rather bad at. Well, the answer has, has two parts to it, and the two parts are actually illustrated on this slide. The first thing we need to do is to take account of that variability, that uncertainty. So we need to move computers away from a world in which they deal with logic, where everything is one or zero, it's on or off, it's very precise, and move computers into a world where they can deal with ambiguity and uncertainty. So we need a way of dealing with uncertainty. The other thing we're going to do is to sort of take our lead from the human brain, and instead of programming our computers with a set of very detailed rules, we're going to have the computers learn from data. So in other words, to learn to recognize, or to recognize human handwriting, we'll get lots of examples. We'll get lots of people to copy things out, and that gives us lots of data from which the computer can learn. So to be clear, we're doing something radically different. Instead of programming the computer, to recognize handwriting, we're doing something very different, writing a very different kind of software. We're programming the computer to adapt, to learn from experience, and then we're gonna show it lots of data, and it will learn to do a task. And that's how we solve tasks like handwriting recognition, like speech recognition, and this field is taking off in a, in a big way. Something very interesting happened in the last couple of years, a, a new technique called deep learning has made major advances in the field of speech recognition. So speech recognition error rates came down dramatically a couple of years ago. And these systems are extraordinary. They're called neural networks because they have some similarities to the sort of microstructure of the brain. But it's a rather loose analogy. But they have very interesting properties. One of the interesting properties is that if you train uh, a deep neural network to translate, um, let's say, to recognize English, let's say to translate spoken English sounds into text, you find that if you then, uh, let's say you take the same system and you now train it on French, it's better at French, it learns more quickly at French because it's already been trained on English. There's something about the low-level structure of human speech that's shared between French and English and it picks that up. And it turns out that that system that's been trained on French and English picks up Chinese a lot more quickly than it would do if, um, if it hadn't been trained on the French and English. And so the world of speech recognition is about to be transformed. And one of the projects um, that we're a, a little bit involved with, but Microsoft Research more generally is, is very heavily involved with, is called the Universal Translator. So the plan is now to support, I don't know, 100, 150 different languages, and to be able to have a real-time conversation between somebody uh, speaking one language with somebody speaking another language. And it won't be perfect, but it'll be a lot better than not having any, uh, any kind of real-time translation at all. So that, that's just a little hint at how this field is, is beginning to take off. So, um, I said we need to deal with, with uncertainty. We need to move away from the traditional world of logic and ones and zeros and so on, and we need to deal with uncertainty. And we have a way of dealing with that. It's been around for 250 years. It's called probability. So we all know the idea of, um, you know, the probability that it's going to rain tomorrow. We think it's, you know, you know, Darwin Garden Party, yes, it could easily rain tomorrow. It's not certain. Perhaps it's more likely to rain than not. So we all have this intuitive notion of, of uncertainty and how we might quantify it. Well, it turns out there's a, a, a mathematical basis for doing this, and it's probability. And we've met probability in school, perhaps, is this idea of a, of a limit of an infinite number of trials. So what I mean by that is, um, let's suppose we have a coin, and the coin could be heads or tails. If it were a fair coin, we'd say it's 50-50 whether it lands heads or tails. This coin has undergone a little bit of um, stress deformation, as Harry would say, and uh, it's not a fair coin, so it may not have equal probability of landing heads or tails, but we could find out by flipping this coin many, many times and counting the fraction of times it lands heads. And let's suppose we flip it a million times and 60% of the times it lands heads, 40% it lands tails. We say the probability of this coin landing heads is 60%. So that probability is this sort of frequency of events. But we need something much more general. We need to be able to talk about probability of one-off events, probability of things that occur just once that we can't repeat many times. So for example, 
Let's imagine you've never seen this coin before. You don't know its properties. We don't know the probability of it landing heads. That probability is some number, something between 0% and 100%. We don't know what it is. But we can learn about it by flipping the coin many times. And the more times we flip the coin, the more we learn about how likely it is to be heads compared with tails. And after we flip the coin a million times, we're going to be really, really sure about that probability. We know that it's 60% heads, 40% tails. So there are two kinds of uncertainty. There's the rate at which it lands heads, and there's the probability of it being heads on the next flip. So after a million flips, I know for sure it has 60% chance of landing heads, but I still don't know whether it's going to be heads or tails next time. I just know the probability. So those are a bit abstract. So what I'm going to do now is to show you something much more concrete. So there's a little demonstration that, that illustrates the same point, but in a, a rather different way. So this is... Um, Actually, all the demonstrations I'm going to show you are based on technology. It was developed um, by my group here in Cambridge. And this particular one is to do with recommendations. So in this case, we've got a system that's going to recommend uh, movies, films. And this has already undergone a period of, of training. It's been trained on recommendations that have been made by um, thousands of people on tens of thousands of movies where they've said, I like this movie or I don't like that movie. Okay. So it's already munched around on all that information. And what it's going to do, it's going to learn about my personal movie preferences, because obviously they're different from other people's. And at the moment, it knows nothing about me. Okay? So what it needs to do, it needs to learn about my preferences, so it needs some data. So what I'm going to do is to pick a movie, and I'll drag this movie across to the green region. It says, I've watched this movie, and I like this movie. So what it's doing is it's rearranging all the other movies um, according to whether it thinks I like them or not. Now, the vertical position here um, is completely irrelevant. They're just spread out vertically so you can see them. What matters is the horizontal position. So a movie that's very close to the right-hand edge is one that it's very, very sure I'm going to like. It, has a, it says there's a high probability I will like a movie that's here. A movie that's down the left-hand side it says a very small probability of my liking it. It's, it's very, conf uh, very confident that I won't like that movie. One that's in the middle, it's 50-50, whether I like it or not. Now, at the moment, the only thing it knows is that I like this particular movie. Okay, that's all it knows about me. And it's very uncertain. The movies are all sort of clustered around the middle. Very unsure about what I'll like and what I, what I won't like. So what I need to do is give it a little bit more data. So I'll pick another movie, and I'll say, uh, this one, I don't like this movie. So again, it's doing some learning. This is all happening on my, my laptop. And the movies are starting to spread out. What's going on? I mean, what's actually going on is some complex mathematics to do with probability. But intuitively, it's comparing my pattern of likes and dislikes with other people. So if Harry also likes this movie and didn't like this movie, and it turns out that Harry really hates this movie, it, there's evidence there to suggest that I won't like it either, that my patterns of likes and dislikes are similar to Harry's, and so maybe for movies I haven't yet seen, but Harry has, I'll have similar likes and dislikes. But it's not just using data from Harry, it's using data from the tens of thousands of people who have provided recommendations. So you'll see the movies are starting to spread out. That means the, the system is becoming more confident. So let's just pick another, uh, there's another movie that I like, Here's one that I don't like. And you see what's happened now is that they've spread out to the sides. So there are a lot of movies down the right-hand side. It's very confident that I like those movies. And here, here are ones it's very confident that I don't like. And now the pattern is sort of, it's different. There's a lot of white space in the middle. There are a few that it's quite undecided about. So this is what we mean by machine learning. My laptop is learning about my movie preferences by observing data. And as it sees the data, the probabilities go away from being 50-50 and towards 100% and 0%. Its uncertainty is reducing as it sees data. So the computer is learning something about my movie preferences. Um, I'm just going to use this to illustrate one more point which I really like, which is um, the difference between the terms data and information, because um, those terms are both in, in very common usage. But they have, precise, they have precise meanings, and I can illustrate the difference here. So when I 
take a new movie and I say I like that movie or I don't like that movie, I'm, I'm assigning it what we call one bit of data. It's the smallest amount of data, a zero or a one, a like or a dislike. And that's true. Every time I label a movie, that's one bit of data. So that's, that's, that's data. But the information value of data depends upon the context. So I can illustrate that um, with this little example. So let's going to take a movie down the right-hand side. So here's a movie which it is it's very confident that I'm going to like this movie. And let's suppose that I do like the movie. So when I let go of the, the mouse button, watch carefully what happens to the other movies. If you saw that, I'll pick another example. So again, here's one. It's very confident I'll like it. So I'll let go of the button and watch what happens. Here we go. Just a tiny change. It was very confident that I was going to like the movie. So when I said I did like the movie, it was very unsurprising. Therefore, there was very little information in that data. So Claude Shannon, who's, uh, uh, who invented the, theory, uh, invented the field of information theory, actually defined information as the degree of surprise. So that's the, the mathematical definition. And, and the same is true if I give it a, um, a rather surprising piece of data. So here's a movie. It's very confident that I will dislike this movie. But let's suppose I do like it. Watch now what happens when I let go. <laughs> OK, so much bigger change. So there's a much bigger surprise for the system in that rating. Therefore, there was a lot more information. Therefore, it learned a lot more from the same amount of data. In fact, the information content is uh, of a like rating would be 0 here. And it goes um, logarithmically to infinity um, at the left-hand side. OK, so that's the idea of. Um, probability. So we're using probabilities as a way of assigning numbers to uncertainty. So this allows computers now to move out of the world of multiplying numbers together and things which are defined very logically and into the world occupied by people. The world where we're dealing with speech, with, with vision, with the visual world, with um, ambiguous uh, and uncertain information. And it's also the the mathematics which allows the computer to learn. So the computer learns through a reduction in uncertainty, and that uncertainty is expressed mathematically through probabilities. So that was the, uh, the movie recommender example. This is just a toy demonstration, but the, uh, the software and the algorithms uh, behind this demonstration are also powering uh, a, a recommendation system on what's called Xbox Live. And Xbox Live is serving um, tens of millions of recommendations every day on, on movies and games and music and so on. And as well as providing recommendations, it's using the ratings to learn more about the patterns of likes and dislikes in the population, and therefore um, continually improving the quality of those recommendations. <clears throat> OK, so what else can we do? So we can recommend sort of movies and music. What else can we do with this? Well, here's another problem that we might um, wish to tackle. So this is a problem to do with um, image, image processing. So here's a nice picture of a bird. And let's imagine we wanted to take this picture of the bird. We wanted to cut the bird out so that we could place it into another, um, into another image. Okay? It's a very, very common operation. If you're designing a web page, um, you may just want to get rid of the background so your, your product, whatever it is, stands out. Or you're, you're making up the front cover of a magazine and you want to take various different superstars and paste them all into the same image or something like that. Uh, so a very common operation to cut out an object from an image. And you can imagine one way of doing this would be to have something like a sort of an electronic pair of scissors. So you can imagine zooming in and then very carefully going around the edge of the object, cutting it out, defining the edge. Um, and that, that would work. Um, and some packages provide that sort of facility. But there are two problems with this. The first problem is it's really tedious. Well, especially on a high-resolution image, you have to zoom right in. It would take ages to do this. If you want to do thousands of these, it would be very tedious. Um, it also turns out, the second problem is you take that image and paste it into a new image. It looks like a cardboard cutout. It seems to stand out from the surface. It doesn't fit into the image. And the reason is a little bit technical. I won't dwell on it, but if anybody wants to ask me in the questions, I can explain why that is. But imagine we could automate this. Supposing we could make this work with just a few... Um, clicks of the mouse. How could we do that? How could we use this idea of learning and uncertainty to allow us to cut the object out in a, in a few clicks? Well, think about this. Imagine somebody's already told us the answer. Imagine we already knew the boundary of the object for the moment. When we look at that object, we see that 
in this case the bird, it has regions of blue, regions of white, the sort of yellow beak. So the colors sort of define the object. The background has rather different colors, lots of greens in the background. So if I knew which was the foreground and which was the background, I could take all those pixels, all those pieces of image in the foreground, and I could use these learning techniques to learn about the probabilities of observing different colors. And I discovered that there's a high probability of seeing blue and white in the foreground. In the background, there's a high probability of these different shades of green. Now imagine the other way around. If I knew the probabilities of different colors in the foreground and background, I'd be able to work out where the boundary is. Because all the blue stuff's the foreground, the green stuff's the background, roughly speaking. The problem is I don't know either. I don't know the colors, and I don't know the boundary of the object. So I could do the following. I can guess. So I'll start off with a guess that somewhere in the middle of the, middle of the picture is the object and the stuff around the edge that's more likely to be background. Sort of a probabilistic guess. So now that I know the foreground and the background, I can learn the colors. So remember, my guess is wrong. I might guess that it's a rectangle in the middle. But given my guess, I can learn the colors. Given the colors, I can refine my guess for the boundaries of the object. Having refined my guess for the objects, I can go back and refine the colors. And I can go backwards and forwards five times, ten times, until it stops changing. And hopefully, I've converged on a good uh, estimate of the foreground and the background. So let's see if I can uh, demonstrate that. So here is... Uh, so I'm just running, this is part of Microsoft Office, so you can try this for yourselves afterwards if you have um, Office. So this is just, uh, this happens to be PowerPoint, so this is a picture um, in PowerPoint. So I just select the picture and go up to the picture tools. And on the left here is this button called Remove Background. So I click on that, and what it's done is the background, it's colored purple, and the foreground, it's left unchanged. So if I like that, if I'm happy with that, I can just click Keep Changes. And so three mouse clicks, and I've cut the object out from the background. And because the computer is very fast, that sort of backwards and forwards guessing of where the boundary is, guessing the colors in the foreground, that happens um, obviously in a fraction of a second. Okay, that was sort of an easy example. Here's a harder example, because in this case, I want to, to cut out the girl, but the, there are, so the flesh tones are very similar to the sand tones, and there are sort of blues in her clothing and blues in the background. So this is a much harder example. So let's see what happens here. So again, I'll select the picture. I'll click Remove Background. And so its initial guess is pretty poor, as you can see. But what it's done is put up this box, and this box is its sort of first guess as to where it thinks the object is. And I can help it along a little bit by just tightening this box around the object, just telling it very roughly where the object is. So we call that the bounding box. So again, that's just a couple of quick operations. Um, it's doing much better, but it is still a little bit confused here. Some of the sand is sort of in the foreground still. So what I can do then is just give it another little hint. So I can just mark some areas to remove. And I'll just uh, paint across some areas to get rid of. You notice I'm not cutting around things very precisely. It's just a quick gesture to say this bit, somewhere around here, this is, this is wrong. Uh, and likewise, just there. And uh, if I'm happy with that, it looks pretty good. So I'll do Control-C to make a copy. I'll go to a different image, Control-V. And there she is, and probably a bit too big for that scene, so just make her a bit smaller. Stand her on the path. And uh, just give her a little shadow as well, just to make her sort of fit in nicely into the scene. Okay, so that's another use of probabilities. Um, something else we can do. So we can also do the converse. So that was about taking, cutting an object out of one image and pasting it into a different image. But we might want to do the, op the, op the opposite of that. We might want to get rid of the object and sort of leave the rest of the image. So, um, so here's a picture. You, know, you can imagine the scenario. Um, this is a picture you've taken a few years ago, but you know, you've, you've fallen out with the girlfriend, and um, you know, the time has come for a little bit of sort of Stalin-esque um, rewriting of history. So we want to... Uh, we like the waterfall, but you know, we've moved on. So, um, but here's the problem. It's not enough just to get rid of the object. You've got to invent something now. So this is a hard problem. So we've got to invent some image that didn't exist before. 
So it's not a problem. We didn't have this problem in the last example. We've got to somehow fill that in. We've got to invent some stuff. So again, we can use machine learning and we use this idea of probabilities. So we're going to fill the stuff in with, we're going to invent image to go in there, but that image is, is going to be like the stuff around it. Okay? So what we do is we learn about the rest of the image. We learn about the, the properties, the probabilities of different colors and shapes and textures and so on by looking at uh, the rest of the image. And then, having got that uh, probability distribution, we, we, we create random little patches of image to sort of fill this in. Now, they're random, but they're random in a special way because they have to join up. If we just made up little random 10 by 10 tiles or something, they'd all be different and all just look like a chessboard or something. So what the computer does is it has to sort of, it starts from the edge and it fills this in by generating little pieces of artificial image such that they, are, they have the same statistical properties of the stuff around it, um, but they also match onto each other. So again, the computer can be um, told how to do that, and that's the sort of result that we, that we end up with. So again, that's sort of done um, quickly and automatically. So here's the sort of thing that you can do with it. Here's an image where um, it's a scanned image of an old photograph. It has um, damage. So what we really want to do is remove the regions of damage and sort of infill, infill the gaps. Uh, and so that's the sort of result we get. Or well, here's another example. So again, uh, we can just sort of click and uh, remove the object. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so those, are, um, so those are examples then of how we can use both the idea of probability to deal with uncertainty and the idea of learning from data. And those are the two sort of foundation stones of, of my research field. And those are the things which are really transforming computing. And I thought what I wanted to end with was a little bit of a glimpse of really the research frontier. So I want to just say a little bit about something which is a, a very hot topic now in computer science. So I've already said that in, in computing, we get computers to do things by writing software. And the software consists of literally millions of little instructions that the computer follows one at a time. Now, for a human to sit down and write millions of tiny little instructions would be far too tedious. So we have what we call programming languages. These are, they, they go under, there are lots of names to these. There's Fortran and Java and C++ and so on. Lots of programming languages. They're artificial languages. They they're are very constrained, very precise languages. But they allow us to, to say in quite high level, general terms, what you want the computer to do. So you might say, I want to um, copy this file. Right? And you just express that as one line of computer code. And underneath, inside, that's turned into thousands of little instructions for precisely how transistors have to switch on and off to cause that to happen. So these computer languages have been around for many, many decades. They're very widely used. But they all have one thing in common. They're all of the era of deterministic computing. They all deal with logic. So in those computer languages, everything has a very precise value. There's no room for uncertainty. And so we have to sort of cludge things. We have to write lots of complicated stuff to deal with uncertainty. What we'd love to be able to do is program directly with probabilities. This turns out to be really, really hard. So we actually want to be able to treat uncertain quantities as sort of first-class citizens of the world of computing. Um, I'll give you a little example. I decided not to show any computer code because I thought, I know you've all had wine instead of coffee at lunchtime and it's the afternoon and I thought the chance of anybody staying awake through a whole slide of, of code. So let me just talk uh, sort of in words about what the code might look like. Um, a typical thing you have in a piece of software is um, what we call a conditional branch. So we might have a quantity. Let's say the quantity is called coin. And this quantity coin has two values, it's either heads or its tails. And a typical piece of computer code would look like the following. It says, if coin has the value heads, then do the following 50 things. Else, do the following 70 things. Okay? So, when you run that code, that is, say, when you get the computer to follow that instructions, it chunters through and it comes to this line which says, if coin is heads, do so and so. It does a test. It tests to see whether coin is heads. If coin is heads, it does those 50 things. Otherwise, instead, it does the other 70 things. So that's a very common sort of construct in computer software. But now imagine that coin is an uncertain quantity. So coin is neither heads nor tails. 
it's heads with probability 40%, or whatever it was, 60%, and tails with probability 40%. So when the co computer gets to that line of code, it sort of has to do both things, right? The coin might be heads, it might be tails, we don't know. So it better do these 50 lines and do those 70 lines. So it's doing something very, very different from conventional software. And getting computers to do that in a consistent way is really hard. The field is called probabilistic programming. It's something we're very interested in here. It's very much at the sort of cutting edge of computer science right now. And to the extent that we can produce languages that allow us to program directly with uncertainty, that will transform computing because it will allow us to produce uh, applications and solutions very, very easily that deal with the world of uncertainty, just as we can today in, in the world of deterministic logic. Um, there's another reason why it's hard, and I thought I'd, I'd just finish by giving you a glimpse of this, by just highlighting some of the subtleties that can happen when we move from the world of logic into the world of, of uncertainty. So, um, here's a picture of a bus. Uh, right, that's a bus. <laughs> um, that's a car. Now, the bus is bigger than the car. Okay? We'll accept that. Um, here's a bicycle. Now, the car is bigger than the bicycle. So if I tell you that the bus is bigger than the car and the car is bigger than the bicycle, you're all smart people. You can figure out that it follows logically that the bus must be bigger than the bicycle. Okay? We call it common sense. Mathematicians call it transitivity. Okay? That's called the transitive property. Now imagine if... And about, um, I don't know, 60 seconds from now, imagine if I showed you a bus, a car, and a bicycle such that the bus is bigger than the car, the car is bigger than the bicycle, and the bicycle is bigger than the bus. You would be amazed. You would be gobsmacked. Right? So would I, actually, because it can't, it can't happen, because this is really a property of what we call the real numbers. So real numbers satisfy this transitivity property. But I'm going to show you exactly that effect. But to do so, I need to move into the world of uncertainty. And so I have here, before your very eyes, an example of effectively the equivalent of that. These are dice, and they're called non-transitive non dice. And when I first came across these, I was gobsmacked. These are extraordinary. So um, if you're not blown away by this, it's just because I haven't explained it properly. So let me see if I can explain this to you. And then you too can be gobsmacked. Right? <clears throat> So these are what the dice look like. They're perfectly ordinary dice. They're just cubes. They're not weighted or loaded in any way. They're absolutely normal dice, except for the choice of numbers on the dice. Okay? And as you'll see, the numbers are um, a little unusual. Uh, the numbers go from 0 to, um, to 6. Each number appears only on one of the, the, the dice. Uh, this one. Uh, it's just threes. Every number is three. So whatever, whenever you roll it, you always get the number three. But the others have different uh, numbers on different faces. So we can think of the, the dice as not a, a conventional number, like a real number, but it's a random number. When you throw it, sometimes you get one thing, sometimes you get another. So this one has, on four of the faces, it has a two. And on the other two faces, it has a six. OK. So let's imagine we have the following competition. Let's say... Um, uh, I'll give this dice to Mary, and she can roll this dice, and I'll roll this dice, and we'll have a competition. We'll do the sort of best of 11 or the best of 15 or something. Well, I always roll a 3, but this dice, this dice, two-thirds of the time it will come up with a 2, and one-third of the time it will come up with a 6. So, so uh, two times out of 3, I'll win, and once out of 3, Mary will win. So if we do the best of a sufficiently big number, you know, maybe 11, 13, 15, some odd number, I've got a very, very high chance of winning. Okay? So this one, this number is bigger than this number two-thirds of the time. So Mary gets a bit fed up with this and says, well, hang on a minute, I want the yellow one. <laughs> All right. No problem, I'll pick the purple one. And the purple will generate a bigger number than the yellow two-thirds of the time. The green, in the same way, will beat the purple two-thirds of the time. And then the really gobsmacking thing is the red will beat the green two-thirds of the time. Now, this is so counterintuitive that I think you can make lots of money out of this. So what you do 
is you, you go and show these to somebody in the pub or whatever, and you say, you can pick any one you like, and then I'll pick one, and we'll just do the best of 15, and we'll pay for five pounds or something, and they'll lose. And so they'll want the one you've been rolling, and so you pick the next, next one. It'll take a very long time to figure out what's going on. <laughs> so these are on sale exclusively to you today. <laughs> Uh, so actually, we had, um, we had a large number of these made up, and we give them away in, in schools quite a lot, not because we're encouraging gambling, but because it does, um, it's a sort of very practical and hands-on way of um, learning about some of the fascinating properties of probability. So this non-transitivity is just a little hint of the fact that the world of uncertainty, the world of probability, can be very, very different from the, sort of the everyday world of ordinary um, deterministic uh, numbers. So I think um, with that, I'll stop, but I'm very happy to take any questions.